Part Two of A Matter of Importance by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two. The squad ship drove for ground. Patrolman Willis steadied the ship no more than a few thousand feet high above the streak of scorched ground and ashes. It was heading inland, all right," rumbled Sergeant Madden. "Lucky. If it had been heading the other way, it could have gone out and landed in the sea. That would have been a mess. But where is it?" The squad ship descended farther. It followed the lane of carbonized soil. That marking narrowed. The Cerberus had plainly been descending. Then the streak came to an end. It pinched out to nothing. The Cerberus should have been at its end. It wasn't. There was no ship down on Procyron III. The matter ceased to be routine. If the liner's drive conked out where Procyron III was the nearest refuge planet, it should have landed here at least six days ago. Some ship had landed here recently. Set down, grunted Sergeant Madden. Patrolman Willis obeyed. The squad ship came to rest in a minor valley a few hundred yards from the end of the rocket blast trail. Sergeant Madden got out. Patrolman Willis followed him. This was a duly surveyed and recommended refuge planet. There was no need to check the air or take precautions against inimical animal or vegetable life. The planet was safe. They clambered over small rocky obstacles until they came to the end of the scorched line. They surveyed the state of things in silence. A ship had landed here recently. Its blue-white rocket flames had melted gullies in the soil, turned it to slag, and then flung silky gossamer threads of slag wool over the rocks nearby. At the end of the melted-away hollows, twin slag-line holes went down deep into the ground. They were take-off holes. Rockets had burned them deeply as they gathered force to lift the ship away again. Sergeant Madden scrambled to the edge of the nearest blast well. He put his hand on the now solidified glassy slag. It wasn't warm, but it wasn't cold. The glass-lined hole a rocket leaves takes a long time to cool down. She landed here all right, he grunted. But she took off again before the tarp arrived to tell us about it. Willis protested. But, Sergeant, she only had one set of rockets. She couldn't have taken off again. She didn't have the rockets to do it with. I know she couldn't, growled the sergeant. But she did. The Cerberus, once landed, should have waited here. It was not only a police regulation, it was common sense. When a ship broke down in space, the exclusive hope for that ship's company lay in a refuse planet for ships in that traffic lane. Even lifeboats could ordinarily reach some refuse planet for picking up later. They couldn't possibly be located otherwise. With three dimensions in which to be missed and light years of distance in which to miss them, no ship or boat had ever been found as much as a light week out in space. No ship with a crippled drive could possibly be helped unless it got to a specified refuge world where it could be found. No ship which had reached a refuge planet could conceivably want to leave it. There was also the fact that no ship which had made such a landing would have extra rockets with which to take off for departure. The Cerberus had landed. Timmy's girl was on it. It had taken off again. It was either an impossible mass suicide or something worse. It certainly wasn't routine. Patrolman Willis asked hesitantly, Do you think, Sergeant, it could be Hux sneaked back? Sergeant Madden did not answer. He went back to the squad ship and armed himself. Patrolman Willis followed suit. The sergeant booby-trapped the squad ship so no unauthorized person could make use of it, 
and so it would disable itself if anyone with expert knowledge tried. Therefore nobody with expert knowledge would try. The two cops began a painstaking quest for police-type evidence to tell them what had happened, and how and why the Cerberus was missing. After a clumsy but safe landing on Procyron III, and when all sanity demanded that it stay there, and when it was starkly impossible for it to leave. Sergeant Madden and Patrolman Willis were, self-evidently, the only human beings on a planet some nine thousand miles in diameter. It was easy to compute that the nearest other humans would be at least some thousands of thousands of millions of miles away, so far away that distance had no meaning. The planet was something over nine-tenths rolling sea, but there were a few tens of thousands of square miles of solid ground in the one archipelago that broke the ocean's surface. It was such loneliness as very few people ever experienced, but they did not notice it. They were busy. They went over the ground immediately about the landing place. Rocket flame had splashed it both at the Cerberus's landing and at the impossible take-off. There was nothing within a hundred yards not burned to a crisp. They searched outside that area. Sergeant Madden rumbled to his companion. Where'd the other ship land? Patrolman Willis blinked at him. There had to be another ship, said Sergeant Madden irritably, to bring the extra rockets. The other ship had to have brought them and it had to have rockets of its own. There's no spaceport here." Patrolman Willis blinked again. Then he saw. The Cerebus carried one set of emergency landing rockets, for use in a descent on a refuge planet if the need arose. The need had arisen, and the Cerebus had used them. Then from somewhere another set of rockets had been produced for it to use in leaving. Those other rockets must have come on another ship. But it was a trifle more complicated than that. The Cerebus had carried one set of rockets and used them. One. It had been supplied with another set from somewhere. Two. They must have been brought by a ship which also used a set of rockets to land by. That made three. Then the other ship must have had a fourth set for its own take-off, or it would be grounded forever on Procyron III. Patrolman Willis frowned. We look pretty carefully from aloft, he said uncomfortably. If there'd been another burned-off landing place, we'd have seen it. I know, rumbled Sergeant Madden, and we didn't. But there must have been another ship around when the Cerberus came in. Where was it? It probably knew the Cerberus was landing to wait for help. How? If somebody was coming to help the Cerberus, it would be bound to spot the other ship. And it didn't want to be spotted. Why? Anyhow, it must have taken the Cerberus and sent it off, and then taken off itself leaving nothing sensible for us to think. Sounds like d -Links. Then he growled. Only it's not. There'd have to be too many men. d -Links don't work together more than two or three. Too jealous of showing off. But where was that other ship, and what was it doing here? Patrolman Willis hesitated, and then said, There used to be pirates, Sergeant. Uh-huh said the sergeant. You had it right the first time, most likely. Not dealings. Not pirates. You said hucks. He looked around, estimatingly. The rockets had to be brought here from somewhere else where they'd been landed. I'm betting the tracks were covered pretty carefully. But rockets are heavy. Manhandling them, whoever was doing it, would take the easiest way. Hmm. There's water close by over yonder. Sort of a sound in there, too narrow to be a bay. Let's have a look. And the slopes are easiest that way, too." He led off to the eastward. 
he thought of Timmy's girl. He'd never seen her, but Timmy was going to marry her. She was on the Cerberus. It was the job of the cops to take care of whatever dilemma that ship might be in. As of here and now it was Sergeant Madden's job. But besides that he thought of the way Timmy would feel if anything happened to the girl he meant to marry. As Timmy's father the sergeant had to do something. He wanted to do it fast, but it had to be done the right way. The route he chose was rocky, but it was nearly the only practicable route away from the burned-dead landing place. He climbed toward what on this planet was the east. There were pinnacles and small precipices. There were small, fleshy-leaved bushes growing out of such tiny collections of soil as had formed in cracks and crevices in the rock. Sergeant Madden noted that one such bush had wilted. He stopped. He bent over and carefully felt of the stones about it. A small rock came out. The bush had been out of the ground before. It had carefully been replaced by someone. The rockets came this way, said the sergeant with finality. Hauled over this pass to the Cerberus. Somebody must have knocked this bush loose while working at getting him along. So he replanted it, <laughs> only not good enough. It wilted. Who did it? demanded Patrolman Willis. Who we want to know about, growled Sergeant Madden. Maybe Hucks. Come on. He scrambled ahead. He wheezed as he climbed and descended. After half a mile Patrolman Willis said abruptly, you figure they all left before anybody tried to find them? The sergeant grunted affirmatively. A quarter mile still farther the rocky ground fell away. There was the gleam of water below them. Rocky cliffs enclosed an arm of the sea that came deep into the land here. In the cliffs rock strata tilted insanely. There were red and yellow and black layers, mostly yellow and black. They showed in startlingly clear contrast. Right, said Sergeant Madden, in morose satisfaction. I thought there might have been a boat, but this is it. He went down a steep descent to the very edge of the sound. It was even more like a fjord, where the waters of the ocean came in among the island's hills. On the far side a little cascade leaped and bubbled down to join the sea. You go that way, commanded Sergeant Madden, and I'll go this. We've got two things to look for. A shallow place in the water coming right up to the shore. And look for signs of traffic from the cliffs to the water. By the color of these rocks we ought to find both. He lumbered away along the water's edge. There were no creatures which sang or chirped. The only sounds were wind and the lapping of waves against the shore. It was very, very lonely. Half a mile from the point of his first descent the sergeant found a shoal. It was a flat space of shallow water, discoverable by the color of the bottom. The water was not over four feet deep. It was a remarkably level shoal place. He whistled on his fingers. When Patrolman Willis reached him he pointed to the cliffs directly across the beach from the shallow water. Lurid yellow tints stained the cliff walls. Odd masses of fallen stone dotted the cliff foot. At one place they were piled high. That pile looked quite natural, except that it was at the very center of the shoreline next the shoal. "'This rock's yellow,' said Sergeant Madden, rumbling a little. "'It's mineral. If we had a Geiger it'd be raising hell here. There's a mine in there, uranium. If a ship comes down on rockets and landed in that shoal place yonder, why, it wouldn't leave a burn spot coming down or taking off either, you see?" Patrolman Willis said, "'Look here, Sergeant.' "'I'm in command here,' growled Sergeant Madden. "'Hucks didn't booby-trap. Proud as hell and touchy as I'll get out, but not killers. Not crazy killers, anyhow. You go get up yonder, up where we started down, 
then go on away back to the squad ship. If I don't come along, anyhow you'll know what's what when the Aldab comes." Patrolman Willis expostulated. Sergeant Madden was firm. In the end Patrolman Willis went away, and Sergeant Madden sat at ease and rested until he had time enough to get back to the squad ship. It was true that the Hawks didn't booby-trap. They hadn't had the practice, anyhow, eighty years ago. But this was a very important matter. Maybe they considered it so important that they changed their policy concerning this. Wheezing a little, Sergeant Madden pulled away large stones and small ones. An opening appeared behind them. He grunted and continued his labor. Nothing happened. The mouth of a mine shaft appeared, going horizontally into the cliff. Puffing from his exertions, Sergeant Madden went in. It was necessary if he were to make a routine examination. The Aldeb came in a full day later. It descended, following the space beacon the squad ship sent up from its resting place. The Aldeb was not an impressive sight, of course. It was a medium-sized police salvage ship. It had a crew of fifteen, and it was powerfully engined, and it contained a respectable amount of engineering experience and ability, plus some spare parts and, much more important, the tools with which to make others. It came down in a highly matter-of-fact fashion, and Sergeant Madden and Patrolman Willis went over to it to explain the situation. The Cerberus came in on rockets, rumbled the sergeant in the salvage ship's skipper's cabin. She landed. We found signs that some of her people came out and strolled around looking for souvenirs and such. I made a guess that there was a mining man among them, but it's only a guess. Anyhow, somebody went over to where there's some party-colored cliffs where the sea comes away inland, and when they got to that place, why, there was a ship there. Then. He paused, frowning. It would have been standing on an artificial shoal place about thirty yards from a shaft that was the mouth of a mine. Uranium. And there's been a lot of uranium taken out of there. It was hauled right out of the mine shaft across the beach to the ship that was waiting. And there's fresh work in that mine, but not a tool or a scrap of paper to tell who was working it. It must have been cleaned up like that every time a ship left after loading up. Humans wouldn't have done it. They wouldn't care. Hucks would. They're not supposed to be any of them left in these parts. But I'm guessing the mine was dug by Hucks, and the Cerberus was taken away by them, because the humans on the Cerberus found out there was Hucks around. Patrolman Willis said, the sergeant took a chance on the mine being booby-trapped and went in after sending me out of range. The sergeant scowled at him and went on. How it happened don't matter. Maybe somebody spotted the ship from the Cerberus as it was coming down. Maybe anything, but whoever run the mine found out somebody knew they were there. So they rushed the Cerberus. There probably wasn't even a stun pistol on board to fight with and they put new rockets on her." The skipper of the salvage ship Aldeb nodded wisely. A ship coming to load up on minerals where there wasn't any spaceport, he observed, would have a set of rockets to land on, empty, and a double set to take off on, loaded. Yeah. They must have figured, said Sergeant Madden, that we just couldn't make any sense out of what we found. And if we hadn't turned up that mine, maybe never would. But anyhow, they sent the Cerberus off and covered everything up and went off to stay themselves until we gave up and went home. I wonder, said the skipper of the Aldeb, where they took the Cerberus. That's my job. Not far, grunted Sergeant Madden. They had to be taking the Cerberus somewhere. If they just wanted to wipe it out after they rushed it, they could have just set off its fuel like it had happened in a bad landing. And that landing was bad. If there'd been a fuel explosion crater at the end of the burnt line on the ground, nobody'd ever looked further. But there wasn't. 
So there's a place they're taking the Cerberus to. But it's got a broke-down drive. It can only hobble along. They can't try to get but so far. What's the nearest Sol type star? The Aldeb skipper pushed a button, and the precinct Atlas came out of its slot. The skipper punched keys, and the Atlas clicked and whirred. Then its screen lighted. It showed a report on a solar system that had been fully surveyed. Uh uh, grunted the sergeant. A survey would have showed up if a planet was Huck occupied. What's next nearest? Again the Atlas whirred and clicked. A single line of type appeared. It said, Cyrene 1432, unsurveyed. The galactic coordinates followed. That was all. This looks likely, said the sergeant, unsurveyed and off the ship lanes. It ain't between any place and any other. It could go a thousand years and never be landed on. It's got planets. It was highly logical. According to Krishnamurti's law, any Sol-type sun was bound to have planets of such and such relative size in orbits of such and such relative distances. Willis and me, said the sergeant, we'll go over and see if there's hucks there and if they've got the Cerberus. You better get this stuff on a messenger tarp ready to send off, if you have to. Are you going to come over to this, uh, Cyrene 1432? The skipper of the Aldeb shrugged. Might as well. Why go home and have to come back again? There could be a lot of hucks there. Yeah, admitted Sergeant Madden. I'd guess a whole planet full of them that laid low when the rest were scrapping with the Force. The others lost and went clean across the galaxy. These characters stayed close, I'm guessing, but they hit their mine here. They could have been stewing in their own juice these past eighty years, getting set up to put a hell of a scrap when somebody found them. We'll be the ones to do it." He stood up and shook himself. "'It's not far,' he repeated. Our boat's just fast enough. We ought to get there a couple of days after the Cerberus sets down. You'd ought to be five, six hours behind us, he considered. Meet you North Pole farthest planet out this side of the sun, right? I'll look for you there, said the skipper of the Aldeb. Sergeant Madden and Patrolman Willis went out of the salvage ship and trudged to the squad ship. They climbed in. You got the coordinates? asked the sergeant. I copied them off the Atlas," said Willis. Sergeant Madden settled himself comfortably. We'll go over, he grumbled, and see what makes these hucks tick. A raised a lot of hell eighty years ago. It took all the off-duty men from six precincts to handle the last riot. The hucks had got together and built themselves a fighting fleet then, though. It's not likely there's more than one planet full of them where we're going. I thought they'd all moved out. He shook his head vexedly. No need for him to have to go, except they wouldn't play along with humans. Acted like d -links, they did. Only proud. You don't get mad fighting them, so I heard, anyway. If they only had sense, you could get along with them. He dogged the door shut. Patrolman Willis pushed a button. The squad ship fell toward the sky, very matter-of-factly. End of Part 2